Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to this State Library of New South Wales webinar. My name is Michael Adams. I'm a librarian here at the State Library. I'm proud to be presenting this session on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Wherever you happen to be joining us from, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country and their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Thank you again for joining me this morning for podcasting in public libraries. Podcasting's an exciting medium with a remarkably low barrier to entry and incredible versatility in terms of style and subject matter. In recent years, a number of New South Wales public libraries have begun to explore podcasting as a way of connecting with their communities, showcasing collections, and finding new and innovative ways of providing traditional library services. Starting a podcast can be challenging, but also very fun and ultimately very rewarding. And today we're going to be hearing from a number of libraries who have incorporated podcasting into their programming and we'll see what they've learned along the way. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce Christopher Fulham from Liverpool City Library. Chris comes with a strong background in sound and has very kindly provided us with a handout on the audio side of things, which I'll be distributing after the session. Chris has been involved in some very interesting work on podcasts at Liverpool, which I will let him tell you all about. So welcome, Chris. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? I've uh, just turned on my video there. Hold on. Just Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Excited to be here. Excited to have you all here with me. I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm just going to make sure that I can share my sound as I've got um, some audio examples that I'll be showing today. Okay, good morning. Can you all see that? Um, can you all see the screen that I'm sharing now? Uh, we can, Chris. And is it is it showing as um, it's a slideshow? Sli no, it's not in no. slideshow mode. Here we go. Okay, can you see the slideshow now? That's good now. Okay, morning, everybody. I am going to be talking today about podcasting as a programming tool. So talking about how we can use podcasting um, as a way to, to work with the community as an activity. And I'm going to be talking about my experience, in, experience from uh, Liverpool Library. I wanted to give an about me in 30 seconds. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. I thought I'd just give another quick uh, 20 to 30 second cap on, on, on what I've done. So you can decide whether to, to, to listen or not. <laughs> but uh, once upon a time, I did do a Bachelor of, of Music with an honors uh, component, and I did major in sound technologies. I then spent time at Camden Libraries, uh, The Space, so working in their facility there. They have a great uh, recording uh, studio there. If you haven't checked that out before, I definitely recommend it. Uh, and we did recording of a number of um, musicians and, and activities with young people. I went from there to work at uh, Fairfield in the Studio 216 service, um, where I did a lot more podcasting there, more as a service, providing it as a service. So customers would come in and, and utilize it. But I did do some activities with school groups um, and, and things like that. And today I, I now work at uh, Liverpool Library uh, in, back with youth, uh, which I do enjoy, and and doing uh, basically podcasting as as an activity. So today I'm really going to be honing in on talking about uh, conducting community podcasting workshops and activities in in a library context. So I'm not really going to be talking about the service providing um, where you might have a service arm for podcasting, and I'm not really going to be talking about actually doing your own podcast. I'm going to be talking about that community podcasting workshop side of things. And I'm going to give a really quick uh, overview of some equipment and some post-production tips and tricks. And I have provided Michael, as I mentioned, with a, a four-page handout uh, that he will send around after the presentation. So you can learn a few terms uh, and some, some tips I've put there together for you for the audio side of things. So without further ado, community podcasting workshops. Let's talk about it. Drum roll, podcasting with schools. Here's a uh, photo in our new Create Space at Liverpool Library, uh, working with Liverpool boys. Um, 
and I wanted to start here with schools because I think this is uh, probably something that a lot of uh, libraries are looking to do. And I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because I'm not sure how you feel about this, but this is definitely how I feel sometimes when working with engaging educators. I kind of feel like the, the gentleman on the right uh, there where I'm, I'm pushing what I only think is maybe manure up a hill. Uh, it, can be, it can be a bit of a slog. Uh, and it can also be kind of like we're out at sea fishing. So I, I feel like I'm constantly out there trying to reel in educators to work with us. I'm constantly throwing my line in. Um, I'm constantly trying to, to, to reel in some fish. And I just wanted to talk about this really briefly because I don't think it gets talked about enough. Uh, I wanted to talk about my process of engaging educators and uh, doing a little boot camp style here. So I've added this slide here, uh, gone fishing. Um, and this is sort of the process that I'll go through when I meet an educator. And the first thing I wanted to say is you've met, a med you've met an educator, uh, I, I'd like to give them my business card, give them my contact details. And the one thing I think we often forget to do is get their details. So this happens time and time again, where we're in a busy environment. Uh, and it's really important that we get that uh, educator's contact details, because I don't know how many times you guys have heard it, but uh, I will contact you um, from your teachers. They're, they're very busy and it's unlikely that they're going to do it on their own. You also need bait. What are you going to suggest that you're going to do together? Uh, I like to have an A4 educational brief or maybe an e-flyer ready. And then the next day, basically, after I've met with them, I will send them an email. You know, be assertive. Uh, we're not going to spam them, but we will send them an email, attach your e-flyer, attach your A4 educational brief, and just reiterate that you're excited to work with them and, and what you would like to do with them. And now this is the third thing in, uh, that I think we got to do is suggest some dates, okay? Throw in some arbitrary dates uh, and times, even if it's in the following school term, you know, it's not going to happen next week or a fortnight from now. Particularly look at, you know, say term four, uh, if we're in term three, or even start looking at next year. But, but definitely just chuck in an arbitrary date. Say, what about this day and time in the morning? Would this work for you? Um, and that just starts getting the, the process moving because if we don't get a date or a calendar invite going, it's not going to happen. Like, I, that's just something that I, I, I really like to hone in on is just saying, get the date, get the date on the books. Okay, really try to get that date. And then you want to deliver quality. The day comes around, you want to do something that resembles what you discussed you were going to do. Um, because educators really talk to each other. That's your reputation. You want to do a good job, of course. Um, it it will, will vary a little bit, obviously, from time to time, what it is that you're delivering. But really, you, you, want, to, you want to try and to deliver on what, what it is that uh, you said that you're going to deliver on. And please, document what you do. Uh, take photos, recordings, videos, get feedback forms. But the big ones, above all else, get photos. Because I think this, uh, this doesn't happen enough. We don't document enough what we're doing, the great work that uh, libraries do uh, and librarians are doing. And really, this is what you're going to use to catch your next fish. This is, this is more bait. Uh, when you have those photos, you're going to do your next EDM for the next term. You're going to put it out uh, and you're going to want to have some great photos to say, look at what we're doing uh, and hopefully get a few more fish on the boat. And don't be discouraged. Um, building rapport with educators uh, is, is time consuming and we need to have a lot of patience. But don't be disheartened. You know, just keep, keep going at it. Keep putting your casting line in. Uh, keep looking for new bait. So, uh, yeah, go fishing, everybody. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the bait that I'm using at the moment. And the bait that I'm using at the moment is called the Tomorrow Podcast. So you can see there on the left, that is my educational brief, my one pager that I will email out after I've met with somebody, maybe discuss that we can do some podcasting together. I'll send them my one, one page A4 brief on the project. And this project, the Tomorrow Podcast came about because Liverpool Library is turning 150 this year. And to celebrate, uh, I was asked if I could come up with a, a youth activity that we could do. 
And what I came up with was this idea of we could podcast and talk about the future with school groups and local youth groups um, and local groups in the area. Uh, and this coincided with the fact that we were actually taking uh, a pulling out a, a time capsule from 50 years ago that happened in July of this year. And we'd have all this material that we could then prompt students to, to think about, think about now and think about what life will be like uh, in 2072. So this gave us a great premise to actually develop a bit of a podcast. So let's have a look at what that looked like. I will just talk there too. I also did, we did a, um, a, a, uh, a postcard to the future, like a love letter to the future. And you're gonna see a picture of that in the next one here. So this was, uh, this was our outreach for the Tomorrow podcast with John Edmondson High School. You can see there, they've all filled in their love letters to the future for 2072. And we took the equipment off site with us uh, and set it up so that they could uh, actually record their podcasts. Uh, they were invited to contribute to the, the Tomorrow podcast by sharing their thoughts on, on what it would be like in 2072. And, and we also invited a representative from the Liverpool Regional Museum to come out and share information about the recent time capsule as well to try and get a bit more interest there. I'm going to play uh, one of the works uh, that the students did on the day. Uh, it's actually the girls in the photo there, which I think is great. That, and this is what they um, said. Hi, welcome to the Tomorrow podcast. I'm, I'm Shelby Pohl. And I'm here with my co-host Sophia and soundtracker Brianna. Um, and today we're going to talk about what the future will look like in 50 years. So, Sophia, do you think there will be more creative job careers in 50 years and why? Yes, I do. I think that there will be a bigger expansion of creative um, job careers just because already we're seeing um, art and YouTube and all of those kind of platforms become more of a career to people, so yes. Um, I have a question for you, Shelby. Yep. What do you think would happen in the future in comparison to right now? Um, I feel like technology is going to definitely develop like a lot. Like right now, it's very prominent in our lives, but I feel like in 50 years, it's going to be like more of a need than I want, like yeah. even in the education system right now. Um, owning a device makes like studying and oh, it makes like, life so much easier. It literally, it's a, it's basically a need right now, and I feel like um, yeah, like with like technology that's very like you know like high tech equipment and like mm -hmm. softwares that the general public doesn't have access to right now is going to be mm -hmm. very mainstream. So yeah. that's I feel like it's going to be kind of like how like video editing like 50 years ago most people didn't have access to that, but now mm -hmm. it's just like you know you have Photoshop and like all this like other stuff. So I feel yeah. like, um, yeah, like so stuff like nanotech, uh, drones, um, augmented reality, we're gonna be seeing like a lot more of that in mm -hmm. the, the future. Yep. Um, and then I have one final question for you, Sophia. Yep. So um, what item would you put in a time capsule for the future and why? Well, I would try to put a Spotify playlist in. <laughs> I would do this because um, it shows what kind of music was popular now, um, what type of genres we, li we listen to, and also it kind of shows us if we listen to anything from 20 years back or 50 years back, you know? Yeah, that would be really interesting, especially. Yeah. I'll just stop it there, but I thought that was so interesting. They want to send a um, Spotify uh, playlist to the future so people could review what they were listening to uh, today. I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of how I structure these or how you might be able to structure um, these sessions when you go out to work with a group or school group, particularly doing outreach. Uh, you want to think about, I guess, the class size, size uh, and the length of the engagement that you have, particularly if you're going to a school. You may need to modify your schedule to meet the needs of the day. So they might only have one period they can engage with, or their periods uh, are definitely different lengths in time. But generally, I try to ask, can we get, you know, 70 to um, 120 minutes, so at least two hours, if possible, you know, do it across two periods to get the best results. Um, think about how you're going to package up your equipment, bring plenty of batteries, check your SD cards. 
um, and think if you need a trolley or something like that, don't break your back like I did at the last one where I was carrying a big, uh, lumbering around with a big uh, box trying to get into the school. So uh, I've worked out that I need to be taking a trolley to, to get all the gear in inside the school. Um, and, uh, you know, keep your presentation fairly brief. It, it's better to get as hands on as, as soon as possible. And I always love to get the students to actually help set up the equipment. It's a great chance to demonstrate and talk about the equipment, and actually get them hands on setting up the microphones themselves, setting up the recorders. And then I always love doing a demonstration interview with the teacher. They, they find that fascinating uh, to hear from their own teacher and, and it really sets the tone. And I always get them to split into say groups of three. So you've got an interviewer, interviewee and a sound recordist. Um, and this way, uh, this way, uh, if one of them really doesn't wanna get behind the microphone, they can opt to be the recordist. Uh, but also uh, it, it means that you can get through all those groups. So if you've got a group of 20, uh, you're really only looking to do about seven groups uh, of actually recording. And I use how old fashioned a, a worksheet you can see on the left there, but I do think it helps just to get them really to be writing those prompting questions and just being able to actually plan the discussion a little bit and talking about that, that, that you want to have a conversational style and get and invite people into that conversation. So the worksheet really does help just um, facilitate that, that time in their group uh, before they jump in front of the microphones. Uh, and they jump, jump in front of the microphones in front of their peers. And I generally aim for about a two minute podcast each group. And then they actually present in front of each other. So it's a good presentation skill that they're developing as well as using the technology. So we've done some other engagements too. And this is why I wanted to talk about podcasting as being this sort of modular activity that can be uh, applied uh, and in, in other contexts. It doesn't just have to be a part of one uh, activity that you've presented uh, to an educator, it's like say the tomorrow, past, tomorrow podcast, but you can actually slot it against whatever it is that you're doing at the time. And an example of this that we did with uh, All Saints High School is they were coming and doing their research activities here. So developing research questions as part of their CSIRO STEM program, and they were finding resources here in the library. So what we ended up doing was I got them to actually document uh, their research uh, that they were doing. So uh, discussing with each other, what is your research question that you've come up with? What are some resources you found here at the library? And I'll give a, a little short uh, bit on this as an idea of something different that you can do uh, to still utilize your podcasting equipment, um, but it might not be in the same way, in a more documentation style. Hi, I'm Saloni and I'm from All Saints. And today we have Stephanie here. Would yes, hello. Like? Um, so I would like to ask you, what's your research question? Um, our research question was due to the increase of transportation in the Liverpool city area, discuss how the community of Liverpool reduces air pollution and becomes more environmentally sustainable. That's good. Um, what are some of the like, materials and facts that you've kind of research for this? Uh, yeah, so one source we um, saw was global warming, fossil fuel and pollution, and a fact we got from it was hybrids are more able to, uh, able to reduce 90% of smoke pollution, which is a good solution to um, bad pollution, air pollution. So that just gives you an idea that you can slot this into your research projects uh, and just emphasize the importance of documentation. The group came back two weeks later. They'd have all, of course, thrown away their research questions. And it was really good that we had this documented, that we could listen back and write down their research questions and, and really honed in the fact that you need to be uh, documenting as you go. And uh, podcasting is a great way to document. We also did an engagement there uh, with Liverpool Boys High School. They came in and they were talking about their big picture um, pro research projects, which is an alternative to the HSC path. And what they called it was big picture radio, which I thought was fantastic. They just came up with that on the fly. And I just wanted to say my experience with them, it alternative pathways, um, that the microphones are really powerful items. 
Um, and they can actually bring out voices in students that otherwise may have le been left unheard. It, it, there's something powerfully transformative about getting somebody behind a microphone. And then suddenly this voice in these young people just changes. And it's, it's incredible to hear uh, what, they, what they would then have to discuss and, and explain why they're doing their projects and what they're excited about. One of the boys in this photo here uh, then told me after that engagement, I saw him again a few weeks later, was saying that he was now uh, volunteering at the local radio station, that he decided that presenting is something that he actually really loves. So it's, it's awesome that we get to be involved in this kind of thing in libraries and, and actually op offer these opportunities and hopefully inspire some young people to, to take up um, uh, digital equipment and uh, take up digital opportunities. So I just wanted to link in back to why I was, you know, drilling in about uh, educators and why we really need to fish to get those educators, because I think podcasting really works best when we're working with captured audiences. I mean, this is just me and my experience, but I believe it really does work best when you get uh, an already established community group and you bring them in and you think, well, what am I going to do with this group? I know we're going to do podcasting. And you think, uh, you know, we can really shape it to the needs of the day, whatever that could be. And these were some of the groups that we worked with um, for the Tomorrow podcast. We had Navitas, which is the local multicultural community group uh, coming, coming in and uh, we get them to practice their English and, and uh, they'd interview each other. They love it. They love telling me all about, you know, what they call the recorders and microphones and equipments in, uh, in their, their languages. Um, we just have a bit of a conversation, but there's something so powerful and exciting about getting these people in front of a microphone. We also had U, U3, University of the Third Age come in, which is like a, uh, an, an older education group, and they actually gave us some history about Liverpool. So we sort of did um, a group together where we did some oral histories on the fly, which was really great. And that's all going into the Tomorrow Project as well. But really, I, I would really stress, if you can work with captured audiences, it's going to go a lot smoother. We did do some school holiday activities, and I have done podcasting activities one-offs in the past where you schedule it in your public program. But I think it, I think it actually works better when you've got an established community group and they're excited to, um, to, to work together. They maybe already know each other a little bit, and, and you can find that, that magic of a conversation is much easier to, to flow when it's a captured audience. This leads me into my next thing. Don't go it alone. Partner up, internal or external, draw on those networks. Um, I really, really encourage you to think who internally can I work with uh, to, to amplify my opportunity with, with podcasting. On the right there, I had our fabulous uh, regional museum uh, worker, Anne. She came out and she's actually holding there. You can see it's actually the top of the time capsule that was uncovered in July of this year. That was the plaque. And she, she brought that round and showed a video of the unearthing of the time capsule. And that just really excited the students. Um, and, and it really helped me too. I didn't have to come up with an exciting presentation. I could just jump more into the podcasting side of things. So if you can bring somebody else in or work with another group or work with somebody else to, to bring the interest, and then you can just focus more on the, um, the actual delivery of the podcasting itself. Um, that, that made it super easy for me. And on the left, we had the, the Liverpool Youth Council, which was so excited to, to share their, their views about uh, Liverpool tomorrow. Um, they, they were fabulous. Uh, they just had this fabulously positive view of the future, which I, I needed to hear, particularly after COVID. It was amazing to hear um, these positive views coming from them. But yeah, really, really uh, what I want to say here is, is partner up. Who's around, who's keen to work, work with them and set up your engagements. Okay, it helps to have a space. It definitely does. I think there's something uh, really, really helpful about having a designated room. It just, it just sets the tone when a group walks into a space that's already set up with some microphones or is, is designated to actually doing content creation or digital content creation. Uh, if you can set up a space like this, we've just set up one here that we're calling the Create Space at Liverpool Library. Uh, we didn't spend too much money um, to, to transform an old room, a bit of wallpaper, some some curtains, you know, a little bit of equipment, you know, we probably did it on, on five to 10 grand. It wasn't a lot to, to create up a, create a space that is suitable for people to come in and actually do that digital work that they want to do. 
and it makes all the difference when you bring in an established group to come in and see that space. It just kind of sets the tone from the get go when they walk in and see, oh, this, you know, this space is ready to, to be utilized. And while you can do uh, podcasting on, you know, say phones or digital recorders or anything else, there's something about having those microphones and equipment ready to go that, uh, you know, really will improve your session. Okay, I'm going to jump into equipment and post-production. I'm going to talk about this fairly quickly, um, but just more talking about some tips and tricks from my experience. First of all, here's like an overview of like a, a equipment for particularly outreach. So if you're going to go offsite, these are some of the things that you're going to probably want to have a look at getting. You want to have at least two vocal condenser microphones. You don't have to spend a lot of money on these. And I think it, it can be... Um, you can might think that you need to spend a lot of money on microphones, but I would argue that, you know, any condenser microphone, I'm just using hundred dollar condenser microphones. It's actually more in the te technique of how you use them than the quality of the mic you, in the library setting and capacity. You don't need to spend $400 on microphones. A uh, hundred dollars should do fine. You need a couple of pop filters. They remove, um, unwanted popping noises when you're talking um, and you, you they only go they only run you like twenty dollars each so so definitely get a few of them maybe get a, th a third or fourth because they they get damaged pretty easily uh, and you want a couple of uh, row where well, you could use road microphone stands but any microphone stand arms will be suitable they just clamp onto the side of your table and then your your microphones will sit on top of those you need a couple of microphone cables two xlr one meters will do fine and you want a Zoom or Tascam, generally a stereo recorder. It must have external microphone inputs. So definitely make sure that when you're getting a recorder, you can get handheld recorders that only have inbuilt microphones, but you want the ones that you can plug in to external um, condenser microphones and, and power them over phantom power. So definitely have a look um, at that and make sure that you're getting one uh, underneath that have got the microphone inserts. And you need a pair of headphones and a 32 to 64 gig SD card uh, and lots of batteries, pack lots of batteries. Uh, <laughs> it's nothing worse than getting off site and realizing that uh, you don't have enough power to run your run the show. So, okay, this is just a tip from me. Measure twice, record once. Okay, so these are the things I like to think about. You're going out to outreach the next day. Uh, what you might want to think about is, do I have enough batteries for my Zoom recorder? Have I checked there's enough space on the SD card? Uh, have, I, have I put it into the, uh, into the device and checked that it's formatted? You never really know when you're going to do the interview of your life. You, know, you, just don't, you just don't know when it's going to be. You don't know when someone's going to say something amazing. And you don't want to get to the end of that session and go, oh, no, the SD card was, wasn't formatted right. It didn't record. Or the SD card, uh, you know didn't have enough space and it stopped midway and I didn't realize and I've, I've lost half that recording and I'm speaking from experience. It's happened to me. So, <laughs> so learn from my mistake, measure twice, record once, check all your gear, do a dummy run and make sure that uh, you're happy uh, with, with how everything's going to record. As mentioned earlier, I've got a four page handout for more technical terms that I've sent to Michael and he will send that out um, later. So you can have a look through that. And this is another one, post-production, keep it simple. I think it's really easy to think, oh, post-production, there's so much we can do. Do we need to add reverb? Do we need to, do we need to change things? Do we need to master it you know, perfectly? I, I'm just going to say to everybody right now, keep it simple. Uh, it, it's so easy for post-production to exceed the scope of your project. Uh, you, you can spend so much time and energy trying to, to fix things in post and and, and change things in post. But I, I would really argue that, particularly for what we're doing in libraries, you wanna keep this as simple as possible. And most of your work should actually be done at the recording phase. If you have clean, clear, crisp recordings, that is what you wanna be focusing on. You, you wanna get the recording process right, because that'll make your post-production um, process very simple. So I won't talk too much about the, the ins and outs of post-production because I just don't have time, but I have sent through a bit of information on that and feel free to contact me. Um, but here's my third tip here. Use online digital audio workstations. Use an online door, what's called a door. 
And that's is what now becoming rapidly my go-to. I use one called BandLab. You can actually just put all your audio straight onto the, the cloud in, in the web. It's free to use. Okay. And it's, it's fantastic because you can actually invite people to come and edit on any of your podcasts or your work, and they can actually just access the session. And instead of transporting heavy wave files, like we used to have to do, uh, where you need to have a big um, hard drive where you, where you take all your wave files around to edit it from one session to another, you can actually just leave them stored online and, and work, work online. So I really recommend people look into this as an option. Because uh, now when I finish the podcast or worked with a group and I need to send it to a school group, I'll quickly just on my computer at work, jump online, upload my audio, uh, quickly mix it and master it uh, all using an online digital workstation. But if you are looking for a digital audio workstation that's not online, there are heaps to pick from. So Mac users, you've got Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Logic Pro, GarageBand you know, Audacity, FL Studio, there's heaps that you can have a look through. And of course, Windows users as well, there are heaps that you can use as well. But really, I really recommend people have a look at band, something like BandLab, it's completely free, you just make an account and uh, you can actually start editing and recording online today. Okay, and also just another tip and trick here, um, if you're looking for royalty free music to if you want to have an intro and an outro to your podcast and you want to add some some sound underneath youtube actually provides completely free royalty free audio they have an audio library that you can utilize uh, you can go in there and listen to something that's going to suit your track you can download it and you can use it completely royalty free which i think is just incredible uh, and a lot of people don't know about this so definitely that's a great resource for you to have a look at and use and it'll just bring a little bit of energy to to your program uh, to your podcast. Now I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that the time capsule contents and the tomorrow podcast audio is going to go on display at Liverpool Regional Museum in late September. And I just wanted to play you a two minute snip um, of what people said. I've cut it together and, and we can have a listen to this uh, together now. Oh, oh, no. Welcome to the Tomorrow Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Tomorrow Podcast. I want to ask you about the, the future. On what Liverpool's going to be like 50 years later. 2072. 2072. 2072. What do you think are the major changes in Liverpool coming 50 years from now? Faster car here in Liverpool because there will be on a battery maybe, there will be easy to charge. Um. Um, I think at the moment we're all really excited about um, the new airport that's coming to Liverpool. True. Um, so we're all really excited about the world essentially coming to Liverpool and uh, Liverpool going out to the world. Yeah. We use the phone to pay for everything. We don't need to bring our wallet to uh, around. Yes. Yeah, just use our phone to boop, boop, boop to pay for everything. There could be this auto drive, like you just sit back, lie down while the drive automatically drives you wherever you want. Um, and I 100% think art will progress the most out of everything, as digital art is growing really fast at this um, at this time right now. There will be new growth and job opportunities as well, and I believe that would be essential for young people. We're yeah, also really talking about youth that have access to universities such as Wollongong and, South, and, and Western Sydney University. These are the same university students that are going to be our future nurses, doctors, engineers, mathematicians. Wow. All right, I'll just stop that there. And uh, bring up the final slide. If you've got other questions, uh, you can email me, you can call me, uh, send up a smoke signal. I'm happy to answer anything when it's relating to podcasting or digital content creation. So please um, contact me with any of your questions. I'll just leave that up for a moment. If you wanna grab that and maybe we'll put, uh, uh, Michael, Michael, you might be able to send, send around my details if anyone has any questions. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Just just one question we got about sharing your slides. Would you be happy to distribute those after the session? 
Yeah, absolutely. Happy to happy to share those slides. No dramas and um, that four page handout. And and that handout is actually going to describe things, more technical things like uh, terms that you might come across, like uh, gain, volume, the differences, uh, what kind of levels to set your microphones to, and all that kind of stuff is on the handout. So definitely have a look at that, guys. Okay, thank you so much. What a great project, and I can't wait to hear more about it. Uh, so thank you so much, Chris. We will move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have from City of Parramatta Libraries, Yan Zhang. Uh, Parramatta have two podcast channels that have produced a really extraordinary amount of content over the last few years. And so Yan is here to talk about the second of those podcast channels, Paracold. So Yan, thank you so much for joining us and I will hand over to you. Hello everyone here, can you see me or hear me? We can, Yan. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and uh, wow, what a presentation from Liverpool, Chris. This is very good and nice to know. And from Parramatta, I think, and uh, yeah, we probably more grassroots and none of us here and that technical. <laughs> so I think ours are more practical and, uh, you know, using a more easier approach. And I'll, I'll be going stop uh, stop my videoing and upload, uh, upload the screen. the screen can you see it oh uh, we can yeah is that better that's good yeah and um, first and uh, i would like to just you know uh, acknowledge where i sit here today i would like to acknowledge that we are here today on the land of the Darug people the Darug people are the traditional owners of this land. City of Parramatta also acknowledges the present Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within this area. Yeah, and I will start very quickly talking about the community profiles. And unfortunately, we forgot a very brief and update from the census from last year. So we could see this is very changing and diverse and innovative council. And we have our population increased by 13.5% in the past. And we have increased overseas born people by 3%. And while non-English language have increased by 7%. Interestingly enough, and we have a relatively younger population and mostly a family with the children. So this is, is the, in comparison with the New South Wales and the greater Sydney. And the more professionals living in the LGA and also with a high level of tertiary education residents in the LGA. So that all have impact to our, you know, and the program strategies and the engagement and how and where and when, how we can engage with the population. So we have a total population of 256,000 and with the overseas bone 58%, which is much larger than the Greater Sydney and the New South Wales. We have a, and the language is spoken at home as about 62% so versus 30% of New South Wales. Interestingly, and we do not have details, if these people speak under the language at home, are they bilingual and or more than two languages? Or can they speak English as well as read English, which all have implications for our programs offering from the library? The top languages being Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, Hindi, and Arabic. So this is a very innovative place with the numbers of universities, which and presently and the Parramatta libraries, we still in the last month of moving into the new location, we share the space and the building with the, and quite a few universities their campus at Parramatta. 
uh, we do have a lot of uh, research facilities, professional bodies and schools in the area all have created a very competitive environment for the library. Just like if we want to, to do the thing, the others are more professional, they can pro probably and, uh, deliver the programs better than us. But also on the other hand, it provides uh, partnership opportunities for the library as well. So why podcast? And mostly, and uh, I tried to answer, and because when Michael approached me and sent me a list of questions, so I might just go and with the list of questions and see if that will, you know, uh, address some concerns that other libraries might think about. Yeah, the podcast is easy to do. Which, while saying this, it is a part of our digital assets. We do have the others like uh, and social social media platforms like uh, Facebook, Twitter, and also we have a YouTube channel and uh, we have quite a few you know digital platforms to play with. And easy to do because uh, using a mobile phone plus a headset and you can basically just uh, yeah on the go. And easy to upload because that's not a huge file, not like YouTube. So I will mention it, why this is important, particularly in the lockdown in the last two and a half years, we really had a difficult and uh, it's like more than a hundred lobby staff on the, you know, basically locked away alone by themselves trying to deliver programs and without any proper, proper equipment or any proper material. So initially we developed uh, a reader's advisory platform, which is called uh, an Parallel Pods. That's a way before an Apparel Cloud. That, that platform, basically, we deliver the book reviews, author talks, information, and uh, everything about uh, books and uh, authors. Then, then uh, all of a sudden, we had uh, this lockdown, and uh, we, 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 we had to develop a program so that is uh, more than just books. So that's why we have uh, and uh, another podcast the channel in a, and after after a while. And it, easy to do. Another easy to do is one single staff who handles editing using Audacity. Yeah, it's good to know. Chris said that there are quite a few and workstation is free online. And the staff who work from home could develop a program and deliver that program quite easily. An audience can listen from their mobile devices or on the website, from the website. We use the Podbean and uh, Apple podcast. We have uh, uh, the pod, para, para pod, the RA channel exists for a few years pre-COVID. And then and when COVID started and the first lockdown happened in Sydney in 2020 March. So we used uh, pod, pod, Parapods to deliver some messages to our cold community. After three months of trial on Parapods, a, a new channel has been developed, which is called Paracold, because we found and uh, because of the language, you know, barriers, and a lot of people wouldn't even go to Parapods. So we decided a new channel, particularly called the Paracold, and uh, to be separated from Parapods. So how, that's uh, that's about uh, in 2020, after three months of uh, trial on Parapods. So the initial initial podcast for called community called communities was on Parapods, and then and uh, moved into the new channel. So the content development and. Uh, there are some tips and with the, the content development, what we have done and uh, after the initial, you know, and uh, initial playing and uh, decision making, we tie in all our, you know, podcasts and with the, our core lobby events as well as uh, regular programs. Uh, we do have a, a core event annually and basically whether we would have a one or two core events monthly then regular programs through different locations. So we tie in our content and the creation from there, such as the Library Lovers Day, Seniors Week, Youth Week, NADOC Week, Science Week, Health Month, 
which is today is the first day of Health Month. All considered and continue the in digital format in last two years, although we couldn't run any face-to-face -face programs, but all these programs are still delivered through the digital platforms, which include in the podcast. And we have a regular programs such as story time, English class, ATO talks, health talks, COVID messages, and all of them on the digital platform as well. That there are so many more. So we continue the work with our partners. As, as Chris mentioned, the partner up. We worked with the health department quite heavily in the last two years. It's because it's highly demanded from cold communities, particularly. And they, they had quite initially quite a lot of and information from different channels, which they are not really reliable, or they heard a lot of information from friends, 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 or family members. So people wondered and asked about and about COVID, about restrictions, and there, there were so many messages, and but people just couldn't understand which one they should follow, and then the vaccine comes coming late. So we worked with the Western Sydney Local Health District, which we have a long term partnership, and we with their and the multicultural team, and we worked with the ATO because there are lots of government subsidy and uh, grants when during the lockdown and uh, what people can get, what they cannot get and how they can get uh, all these monies. So this is all part of a podcast. We worked with the ACMA and the ACMA is the Australian Chinese Medical Association. We worked with the CMRC, that's the local community Margar migration resource center. We worked with the Marx Institute, we shipped on a research institute with the Western Sydney U. And uh, we also worked with the uh, tech savvy seniors. So many were happy to supply a podcast in various languages. Interesting enough, because everybody was locked uh, in lockdown. So they actually, people from these partnerships, they worked alone. So that was very easy for them to continue to carry out there and the job and in working with us supplies a lot of uh, and uh, podcast uh, recordings and in different languages. We also other one is we utilize a lot of internal resources and we do have uh, and the staff from more than probably 20 and uh, different cultural backgrounds and we this time we're using staff language skills and the technology skills. When the staff and worked at home alone last year, and we just worked through this, as I said, because this is a lot easier to do than the YouTube. We did have some staff and quite heavily and record themselves and on YouTube, but we did also have staff said, no, I don't want my face to be seen on the screen universally. So and it was quite easy for them just to have a, a you know, a, a a smartphone as well as a headset. Then we provide as a script and some of them that actually translated into different languages. And then that's how we, we used the, the lobby internal resources and the staffing resources. And also folks, uh, because there are so many different languages in the community and we, we basically first focus the more on our key demographics, but we also told the community we are happy to extend to other languages when resources become available. We did receive a one complaint said, oh, why you have that language, not our language. And then we tried to work with them. We said, look, we are very happy if you, you can have a volunteers work with us, we'd be very happy and to do something in the particular language. So from this, and we, Basically, and uh, tying everything and uh, quite uh, neatly with our, you know, and uh, regular programs. So, regarding the community engagement, <coughs> well, I think that the main thing is to have to understand the community profile. At the beginning, we didn't worry because a lot of people, particularly Chinese community, they were not on the mainstream social media they had their own, like a WeChat. 
So we were worried about, you know, and uh, how, and uh, we could actually get them into our social media and our podcast, listen to what we, we do and uh, in, engage with us. So this will need and quite, you know, a lot of and analysis and also identify and who are they uh, and what do they need. Make it a consistent part of marketing and program strategies. Because at the beginning when we planned this and at the beginning of 2020 and called the community program was part of our entire strategic plan. So doing this and we we do not make assumptions like, oh no, they 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 wouldn't even find us, they wouldn't even know us and uh, oh, well, just do not waste the time. We basically just said we try our best and try to engage with them through the digital. And we enhance, enhance our existing promoting channels that community members that actually used to and we converted our e-newsletter to our lobby members from quarterly to monthly. And we linked each individual platform back to the to a central location, which is the lobby website. This actually has a quite huge impact because the lobby website, and it's not that we the site we can control, basically the council digital marketing team, they have the full access and they they basically give us a template and they make decisions on how we set up our website. So when we try to make everything back to this, it means that we have to change a, basically a website and the content frequently update, like at least you know weekly, twice, and even sometimes even more to update this and to link everything like Facebook, YouTube, and the podcasts, everything into this central location. So everybody, by click the lobby website, they can find all the links there. And also all, uh, most of the podcasts and the YouTube links. I think this is a very an essential, particularly at the beginning. And also, and. Uh, it's made the public aware that actually lobby website is not a static site, or it's only offers how to join the lobby and the, the uh, opening hours are where they're located, but it's more than just this. So we also respond to immediate needs, such as information on health, because it, and the COVID is a health crisis. So, when this crisis evolves and there are lots of and the policies, uh, regulations and the restrictions, you know, actions. So we respond quite immediately to all of these. And I understand that the community members are not passively waiting for the information that actually were seeking information all over. They try to find a, information where to. So even just a simple link, like if we make something and in different languages said, if you want to find more information here are the health department's website, both the, and the state and the federal, they provide a lot of language, you know, and the engagement, you can find the information you, in your own language from the library point of view. And the public, yeah, that trust is always there and the public will react very quickly and they respond very quickly. So we do have uh, an uh, engagement marketing and uh, strategies. So that's how we basically work. And when you see this, and uh, that's how I use uh, our usual programs and uh, we market and uh, promote them. So through all these channels, we actually reach out to many and uh, community groups uh, in the local government area. This is also very important because of these local community groups, they have a direct contact with their members, which would help us and actually has helped us and to promote all the information necessary and the, the most urgent information public need at the time. So the 
the outcomes and we basically have had a total of about 190 episodes were created in Paracode, including the first three months in Parapods, and more than 5,000 downloads. It has enabled us to build up an online audience called community audience, which is very important. And uh, the engagement also has enabled us to respond to their needs. It's enabled us to develop staff skills. Yeah, at the beginning, because of this, so a lot of staff said, yes, I am happy to help, I'm happy to do, but I don't know how. And uh, Okay, can you have some guidelines? So we actually developed a lot of guidelines as well as some workshops and we, I talked to them and demonstrated how we could do it, of course. And at the beginning, I even put a hand on and I tried myself and wanted to learn and see the challenges and everything and we built in that's enhanced the staff skills. And I, in it, also enabled us to enhance the capacity of the lobby website. Now, and we actually have a very close relationship with the council digital marketing team, because whatever we needed, and they always would consult us and, and they actually and they listened to us. So they helped us to develop and quite quickly and into and lots of updates. So there, it's not saying and it's all and uh, you know smooth and all sweet and uh, we we have uh, and have come across with uh, some difficulties and also we are still facing some challenges. So how to maintain the side and uh, sustain the side uh, and I think uh, we have to consider and the digital engagement is not only a contingent or temporary approach but. Uh, a coexisting and a meaningful way to engage with the community. This is, I think, and uh, it's probably essential. This year, after we come back face to face, and more, more and more programs become face to face, and it looks that the digital activities slowed down and some even stopped. So, are we going to abandon? you know, the audience which we and spend so much effort to build online, or how are we going to continue engage with them? So this is a question and a quite big question and a challenge for us. Also, I think and as to sustain it, and we have to tie in with the lobby core events and the services. We need to allocate enough resources, which is the crucial part of it, including budget, staffing, and the technology for meaningful support and create a, a proper evaluation method, not only measure the output, but the outcomes. I think this is the last bit of, you know, and uh, about podcast and its measures. And the evaluation and is always very hard because we don't know when we deliver to programs, so many people download our programs how we can hear their stories. They said, yes, I am inspired or I have really learned something or I really and I think this is a good way to, you know, to connect me with the lobby. And we need to hear their stories, uh, which is probably the new challenge for us. So the challenges, I think the COVID other issues impact on the staffing and the budgeting. And we, the moment we are still very, very short of staffed and the evaluation, as I mentioned. The other is the other competitive elements. Saying this because it's so competitive. When you, if you searching and you Google it and want to see how many podcasts, I'm sure you would have come across millions. So now that's the question for us is why they want to hear from a lobbyist podcast. And the resource allocation, staff skills and the content creation and the support from management and the staff. Saying this because and uh, every lobby, I believe, same as us, we would have uh, and uh, you know very few program staff, and we would have a lot of staff working on the front desk. So, how we can continue get the support and uh, you know from staff and they said contribute their time and uh, you know allocate the time for them to do the podcast. And also from the management, have a meaningful and resources putting, 
and also the partnership development and the ongoing and how we can continue sustain the initial partnership as well as develop the new. So these are the challenges and I don't think I have a lots of answers. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, when we started and the parapods and we did buy some and the equipment and we did use some uh, soundproof rooms and it all went very well. But para, para code and basically initially and it was started and it started was a channel to respond to the community, particularly the health crisis needs. So if we want to continue to keep it, there, there are lots of work need to be done. So that's all from me. Here is uh, and my contact details. And if any of you want to send me an email, feel free and welcome to do so. Hey, thank you so thank much, you. Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more evidence of what a great tool podcasting can be for community engagement. So um, that was great. Uh, please, everyone, continue to send your questions through the chat feature. I don't know how much uh, time we'll have for questions. We've got to keep the show moving. So now I will introduce our next speakers, Carla and Lauren from what could, uh, Carla and Lauren from Kiama. Um, they have produced their unique and fun take on the reader's advisory genre and are one of the, the newer entries into the public library podcasting landscape. So uh, I will hand over straight to you and I'm looking forward to hearing from Carla and Lauren. Hello everyone. Uh, can you hear us? Is, is the sound okay? Can someone just give us a little bit of a feedback? The, the sound's fine. Beautiful. Um, I will apologise, we do have a story time going on in the background. Um, it's all happening always here. So the shakers, um, are, out. The shakers are out. Okay. Um, so yeah, hello, I'm Carla. I'm the Outreach Library Officer from Kayama Library. And I'm Lauren and I'm the Jeringong Library Branch Officer. Um, which is also how we started our podcast episodes. <laughs> um, so um, you will hear that many times if you if you decide to tune in to Good Librations. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. We've got a little presentation for you today. Yeah. Yep. Switch to this one. Is that coming through? Can you guys see that? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, essentially, how we started a podcast. So, um, the we are very new. We're only about six episodes into our podcast, um, but we did want to share our startup experience, some of the practical things that. Um, that we have come across, some of the challenges that we've come across starting up um, to anybody thinking about getting started. So this is how we started ours. <laughs> A little uh, index before we get started about what we're going to talk about today, um, how we developed uh, what we're talking about, our recording and editing process, and how we have started promoting our podcast. So first of all, we had to ask ourselves what we want our podcast to be about. Um, like, as you know, there are so many different types of podcasts. I think when we watched Michael's uh, webinar on podcasting last time, he, he gave a good explanation of just how many different um, subjects there are across the board. And so to try and think about what we wanted to put out into the world, um, we really had to think about like, what do we want to talk about? Um, are we passionate enough to sustain the podcast beyond a few episodes? Uh, do we know enough about what we're talking about as well? Like, even if we have all the passion in the world, there's no point putting um, incorrect information out there. So uh, can we research what we need to know? Can we fit researching as well into our role, into our lives? Um, is it just going to be Lauren and myself or will we have guests? And also, really importantly, um, are we going to 
be happy to broadcast our opinion and our ideas and have them be available on the internet until the sun turns black. <laughs> the internet is forever. <laughs> so um, we decided that we could do all of this and we could fit it all in. And, um, and we have so far maintained the passion and the research. <laughs> we'll, see we'll see how long we go. <laughs> so we just popped this quote in. Um, a lot of people listen to podcasts because they want to learn something and be entertained along the way. We've sort of used this a bit as our philosophy for going forward. We, we want to provide information, as Carla said, we want to be passionate about it. We want to do the work and, and, and make it correct. And we want to maybe tell a joke every now and then, maybe make it a little bit funny and entertaining for people to listen to. And so then from there, we had to work out what type of podcast we were going for. So as you can see on the screen, there are many different paths you can take. You can have an interview-based one, conversational. You can go for a non-fiction narrative style, an educational or monologue style, and a scripted improvisational style. So ours is, I mean, it's kind of ed educational, I would say. Yeah. We, we script a chunk of what we say and then we do a small amount of improv improvisation as we go and we try to even with the script make it quite informal as we say it I think we've got better with that over time the first one is probably sounds very scripted but as we've gone on we've relaxed into that a lot more as well and we occasionally do uh interview with someone as well yeah, yeah. um so we had to come up with a name um, and this bit is actually quite important because the podcast name that you choose um, is going to be what people search for. Um, so we had to think about, um, we didn't really want anything too obscure. Uh, we didn't want to use words that didn't hint at our topic. So we have librations in there, you know, good librations. Um, we want the pod to be easy to find um, and easy to come up in a search. And after we created our name, we needed to create a description, um, which might be easier. I found it would be easier to write a description of our podcast uh, once we had written and recorded our first episode. Sure. We kind of had more of an idea about what we were talking about and um, and and. The, the shape of the episode. So we knew what we could put in the, the description. Um, the description is a really important step because once people come across your podcast on any of the platforms, the description is going to be whether that what makes them choose whether or not to listen to you. Absolutely. So we we think that's a pretty pretty important step. Mm, for sure. So um, once we sort of decided the direction that we wanted to go in, um, we began to write. Uh, so we write all of our episodes, as I said, before recording and we ad lib a little bit during that, um, during that process. Um, so we have a good idea before we start of how our episode will go, the shape of it. Um, we, we didn't want to completely ad lib it. We, we found that, especially for ourselves, it, it, it gave us a lot more confidence to have that framework there. And we didn't want it just to turn into like a stream of consciousness situation no. <laughs> where we just went <laughs> off on tangents all of the time, which we can do, you know. Um, so we usually, uh, we found our podcasts are sort of, sort of in the 40 to 50 minute mark. There are some that go over, there are some that go under. Um, and that equates to around sort of 10 to 12 A4 pages of writing and research. And that's after editing. So once we write out what we say, we go through it, we cut it, we rearrange it. Um, if it doesn't work or flow, we change it. We work out what each of us is going to say from that. We divvy it up um, because sometimes it's a thing that Carla really wants to make a point of saying and sometimes it, it's a thing that I want to make a point of saying. So we, we have fairly equal airtime, yep. I feel. And then when we're researching, we really try to use reputable sources, uh, cross-referencing our information from a few different sources and taking note of everything that we use because we put all of those references on our website. Um, anytime we mention an author or a song or a TV show, every single thing gets included in our reference page. It's not a short process, but because there are two of us, we find we can fit it into our schedule quite easily. 
Um, we write where and when we can. Um, and we, of course, we find now that the process at episode six or seven, where we're up, where we're up to now, is a lot smoother and quicker than it was when we did episode yeah. one, <laughs> which so was fun. quite laborious. Yeah, episode so one was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was. So we're a lot sure of ourselves now, and we're still learning, of course, as we go. Um, but it's a lot more comfortable. Sits more comfortably now. Yeah. So I'll just go back because I completely skipped over one of my slides, as is my want. Yeah. Um, so essentially. Good Librations is born. So our podcast is um, made up uh, of, of sections. So our first section, uh, we talk about book reviews or what we're reading, which we think is a good RA tool for uh, librarians in general. A lot of people want to know what librarians are reading. Um, and then we decided that we would do a deep dive into one particular literary topic per episode. So if you have a look at our episodes, we have done poetry, we have done book to screen adaptations, we have done young adult. Young adult, yeah. I can't remember any of the fairy others. Tales. Fairy tales. Fairy tales. <laughs> so um, we'll talk a little bit about the history of these things. We'll talk about uh, their their importance um, to our lives and um, and, and to why the genres we love them. and why we love them as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and then we add a little bit at the end for little funny things, quotes, social media finds, just little related um, bits of ephemera that we can add to that as well and very occasionally we'll do an interview or have a guest speaker as well um so um we also needed to know who our audience was going to be so when we write we try to think of who we're aiming our podcast at and initially i think we thought that we were going to be we we're going to pitch our pod at a younger audience um young adults um but as it turns out when we look at our stats um, our listeners are actually our age They're, or older. Or older. Yeah. So um, that's something to, to keep in mind as well. Like who you initially want to pitch your podcast at is may not actually be who your audience ends up being. So we do have to think about things like does our tone and language suit our audience? Um, can our audience access our podcast? Like if we were going to pitch it at an older audience, like how do we make our podcast accessible to people who may not um, have technology accessible to them um, or the the understanding of it. Uh, so, and we we pretty much, I think, have quite a broad appeal. So um, we do get a little bit of feedback from from younger and older people who, who enjoy the podcast, which is great. Um, yeah. So then it came time to record. And so one of the biggest issues that we faced was finding a space quiet enough to record that did not include background noise or bounce our voices around. Um, so if you listen to our podcast, you will see that our production quality just runs the full gamut <laughs> of sound issues. And this has all boiled down to where we've recorded. So we've recorded, recorded huddled together in a corner of the library before with the microphones <laughs> wedged in between the books, um, in like a little seating nook, um, in someone's garage, and in an actual recording studio too. So look, it's a journey, yeah. really. Um, <laughs> it's a journey. A good rule of thumb to take away is that it's like Chris was saying before, it's easier to prevent audio problems from occurring than it is to try and clean them up later. So finding the right space to record in is just paramount to making sure you have an easier time editing and a better sound quality overall in the end. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about equipment, so another journey that we've been on <laughs> has been the equipment journey. Um, so you can do it quite simply, really. The first few episodes that we recorded, we recorded on a little uh, microphone plugged into Lauren's phone. Um, we could take that anywhere we wanted. We re could record anywhere we wanted. It was there as a file. It was quite easy to move that file around um, and send it to um, whoever was going to be editing it. So in terms of um, ease of use, that was our little yep, microphone that we used. That was great. And actually, the sound quality was not bad. Um, like, if we go back and listen to our first episode, it's actually pretty good. So um, we did decide to move on to um, this kind of a microphone, um, which is still a USB microphone. It's a fairly cheap one that we got from Kmart, um, but we, we do find that the sound quality is just a little bit better 
again. Um, we record on, uh, we now record on Audacity and we mix our microphones because we speak very differently. Uh, Lauren speaks like a normal human person and <laughs> I speak like a town crier. So we have two microphones plugged into a laptop and we use a program called Voice Meter to mix the different levels um, of our microphones so that we both come out sounding oh, kind of the same, oh, turn, kind of on the same level. Turn mine up, turn, <laughs> turn, down. turn Lauren's up yeah. and turn mine down, <laughs> essentially. Um, yep, yeah, and we use or, uh, Adobe Audition to edit our episodes and that's relatively straightforward as well. Um, you essentially just cut bits out, all of the ums and the ahs and the excessive laughing and the mess ups, which I do a lot and um, Lauren is very, very good at um, just moving forward. Um, it's also important to have a program that you can create your artwork on. So once you've recorded and edited, you'll need some promotional tools as well. So um, most of those we have accessible to us. Canva, we use Canva for our all of our stuff, which I'll show you a little bit later. And um, all your social media accounts and the local radio station, which I will also talk about later as well. So then it came to um, choosing music for the program. And as Chris has already discussed very well, um, it's important to use royalty free music for your podcast, intros, outros, fills. Um, we, we think it's a really important part um, of the podcast. The audience gets a lot of information straight away about the tone and the vibe and everything that you're wanting to present. If, you know, if your introduction is, you know, snappy and poppy, um, it gives an indication of what the, the whole podcast is like, or if, you, if you've got a slower, like more ballad-like music, then, then it can change people's perception of it for sure. So we chose where we wanted our music to slot into our podcast, and then we did some research as to where we could get that from. But we decided in the end that um, what we were finding wasn't exactly what we wanted to present for us. So all of the music that you hear on Good Librations <laughs> is composed, performed and recorded by me. Um, so it's awesome. <laughs> and Lauren is amazing. No, no, no. Shh. No, 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 no. no, because look, my piano when I recorded it, in a, in a very sort of low quality way, uh, wasn't tuned. So let's just call it honky tonk. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit honky tonk, but it's also like essentially I just said to Lauren, let's do something that kind of sounds like you're at a circus. Um, and she just came up with it like that. So if you're very, if you're lucky enough to have somebody in your life that knows how to compose um, music and, and, and play music, then by all means, you know, yeah, it, Get in on look, that. it worked for us. Yeah. Um, but like you can see on the screen here, you can find free and low cost music in a number of ways. You've got uh, Shutterstock, Pixabay, Creative Commons, YouTube. They all have free or low cost music. You can pay more if you wish to. You can pay someone else if you wish to um, to create music for you. But make sure you have that written permission to use and distribute that music. So do your research. Um, make sure that contracts and copyright and all of those things are considered. We should always be paying artists for their time and their work. Very important. Um, so we've got the music and we've written our written recorded our um, our podcast, and so now we need to edit. So this is also another really important part of um, the podcast. Process. Especially for us who goes who go off on tangents. Look, we're, we're, we're the queen of tangents. Um, so we took out all of our ums and our ahs and our giggles and our silences. Sometimes you'll just forget what you're saying in yeah. the moment, even though you've got it all written out in front of you. Um, and um, at one point, I think there was just a, a, a two minute long period of Lauren and I just laughing, laughing. hysterically. So you, you need to take all that out because that becomes quite tiresome to listen to quite quickly. Um, and the program, like uh, Adobe Audition, is, is relatively intuitive. So um, it's not that hard, but you can listen, you can watch tutorials on how to use them on YouTube or on the product websites as well. Um, we didn't want to over-edit, though. We didn't want to take all the natural ambiance um, or the vibe out of it. Like, we wanted it to be um, a little bit grassroots. 
um, as well. And it took a few episodes as well to, for us to get into the rhythm of speaking and editing. Um, and I think apparently this is where a lot of podcasters give up. So I urge you to, pr- to persevere. Mm. It becomes far easier and quicker uh, a process once you have written and edited a few episodes. Absolutely. It only takes a couple of episodes before you know what you're doing and, um, and those fiddly little annoying, frustrating things become not so fiddly or annoying um, as well. Uh, so here as well is where we wanted to add in all our music. Um, so we have beginning, we have an intro and an outro, and we also have little little film music um, just to sort of delineate, yeah, our little um, segments as well. Uh, so we then save and export our podcast, typically as an MP3 or a WAV file. Um, and there's a particular bit rate, it's 96 kpvs or um, uh, 192 for stereo or music. So there are a few little guidelines um, that do, that, that does make it easier when you go to upload it um, later on and it makes it sort of nicer to hear, to listen to as well. Um, we also, this is where I, I started, we started creating our artwork too. So, um, the artwork, I think, is pretty important. So when I look at, I'm a pretty visual person, a lot of people are. So when I look at a, um, a list of podcasts on Google Pods or Apple Pods or whatever, um, the little podcast logo is probably one of the things that I'm going to focus on to begin with. So, it it, yeah, it draws you in. Um, like a siren. <laughs> so we just use Canva. Um, for our podcast, I we did design this, but you can, if I click open, I don't know if you guys can see Canva. Can you guys see? Yeah, we're that? seeing that. Yeah, cool. So you can see this is the one that we created in Canva, but they do have templates, podcasting templates. And um, here is the, the many podcast <laughs> logos that we went through before we decided on the one that we that we got um, and so you can see the, the sort of journey that we took to get there um, and then down the bottom these are just some templates that that Canva already had so you can just use what they have um, as well I like these ones because they look like Lauren's glasses um, but that was just all on there as well so um, you know your branding is important and I, I you put it on everything. So um, as soon as it starts, as soon as you have it, it, it's the first thing that people see. It's on everything. You're going to see it over and over and over and over and over again. Like if we look at Spotify here, um, that's just our logo <laughs> all over the place. And if we look at our website, um, there's our logo, and we also do we also do individual episode. We only have six episodes, but we also do individual episode artwork as well, um, which just is a little cheeky little wink to say he's he's kind of what this is about, um, and sort of makes our our website pop as well. So all very accessible to create all of that. Okay, so once we had all of that sorted out. Um, we had our first episode and we needed to distribute it and promote it. And look, this can be frustrating, especially at the start. Like all of the things that we've shown you so far take some work at the beginning. But once you've got that framework there and you've got the format of those little um, insets that Carla was showing you, it's it becomes so much faster and easier to then create more of them. Um, Carla did a lot of work very quickly to learn about hosting sites and RSS feeds and what our computer system would and wouldn't allow us to do. Um, and so she'll explain a little bit about all of that in a minute. And it, it made it difficult, um, but once it was all in place, it was it's very easy now for us to upload and edit our, uh, our episodes to our website and to Buzzsprout, which then disseminates it through Apple, Spotify, Google, and all of those have individual logins, but again, once you're all set up, it's good to go. So we chose Buzzsprout for our distributing platform, but look, they're all quite similar. We pay around $13 a month and we get to upload three hours of content per cycle and the episodes are hosted indefinitely. And for us who kind of do an episode a month, like that's tons yeah. um, of storage for us. It depends on what you want though. 
Um, many of the free hosting sites either limit how much content you can upload or how long they will host them for. So you need to consider all of those things. That's why we chose a paid option. Mm -hmm. uh, we get some statistics through Buzzsprout, but we can also go to Spotify, to Apple, to Google, to our website as well to get um, more information about who is listening. Yep. Um, oh, and just another little note. We also were approached by our um, local radio station, Kaima, Kaima Community Radio, um, about airing and distributing our um, podcast, which they do. We partnered up with them, so that's a really good um, that's a really good tip, I think. Like, contact your local radio station and see if they want to get on board. Um, we also um, are. Um, we will um, contact them for feedback or for um, if they have any information they'd like us to put in um, a, an episode and we may also interview them in a, in a, in a, in a later podcast, in a future podcast. Yeah. Um, so RSS feed and hosting um, for me was a little bit tough. I was a little bit frustrated by this. Um, you will need an RSS feed. Um, mostly if you have a council webpage, you have an RSS um, address on your council webpage. Um, but if you don't or you don't want to go that way, then you can actually just use Buzzsprout like, like we did or Podbean or any of the other ones. So you join the podcast um, podcasting hosting site. Uh, you create accounts for Apple, Spotify and Google and whatever other platforms you want to use. You use the RSS feed that your hosting site provides uh, when signing up to, to the to the platforms, you'll enter into the, enter that RSS feed into the individual platforms. And then when you upload, upload your episodes to your hosting site, in this case, Buzzsprout, it will disseminate those, um, that episode to all of those platforms. So you don't have to individually upload all of your episodes to your individual platforms. Now, I went from knowing absolutely zero about RSS feeds and hosting and, and anything um, anything to do with that kind of side of podcasting to to this. So um, if this helps anyone yeah. at this <laughs> at this point, I'll be very very glad. Um, and then from that, you can you can start to grow your podcast. Um, you can also just use YouTube as well if you want to just um, upload your pods to YouTube and not do the, do all the other stuff. Um, so yeah, so this is a great little video that Buzz Buzz Sprout have put out. Uh, which we're not going to show because we, we need to wrap our, our session up. But um, I will put the link to this um, presentation in the chat and anyone who can who would like to can go through and, and have a look at this. Um, and if anybody would like any more information about our podcast or our process or um, if anybody's struggling with um, any of the things <laughs> that we struggled with, we're always more than happy to, to have a chat about it. Or if anybody has some tips. Yeah, um, sure. for us about how we could do things better. Uh, we would love that as well. We've got our email addresses there and we'll just open it up to questions. Uh, thanks so much, Carla and Lauren. Having listened to your podcast, it was a very on-brand presentation, so thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> we are running quite late in terms of questions, so yeah. once again, everyone, um, please submit them via the chat and Carla and Lauren, if you're happy to answer those after the fact, we can... Uh, pass them along to everyone. So um, thank you so much. At this point, I will introduce Kerry Shaw from Newcastle. So Newcastle are lucky enough to have a very impressive podcast studio, which they've used to great effect with their even more impressive podcast channel, Newcastle Real. So thank you for joining me, Kerry, and I will pass it over to you. Hi everybody, um, I'm going to apologise first of all that I was asked to do this presentation on Thursday of last week, so I'm taking over from Alex, he has provided me with his slides, so if there's any questions I can't answer, I'll be happy to pass those back to him when he gets back from his leave. I have however had something to do with the podcast, so I should be okay. Um, so I'll just try and do this whole technology thing of sharing the screen, hopefully that's working, yes? Yep, that's working. Yep, awesome, okay, thank you. Now just to make sure I can work the buttons correctly on the right screen when you've got more than one, it can get tricky. 
Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm Kerry Shaw. I'm the Heritage Collections and Digitization Specialist here at Newcastle Libraries. Um, Michael is correct. We do have an awesome podcast studio. Uh, I'm streaming to you from the traditional country of the Awabika and Waramai peoples. The city of Newcastle acknowledges and recognises through respect for their cultural heritage beliefs and continuing relationship with the land and that they are the proud survivors of more than 200 years of dispossession. We respect and recognise that the Awabika and Waramai peoples are the first storytellers of our land and their stories hold more than 65,000 years of truth and wisdom for all of us. Our podcast story started out as a partnership with the Newcastle Podcast Studio and Melanie Sargent down there. And it has grown into a del core delivery channel for documenting and sharing Newcastle stories. I'll talk you through some of the statistics and rationale behind our channel, and then some of the podcast report recording partnerships that we have established. Hopefully. Um, so firstly, why do podcasting? That, that came from our, oh, I'm losing my, little talky thing, sorry. Bear with me, people, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, our why behind the podcasting is the library strategy. So our city, our stories and the library, and our motto is a world-class library for a smart, livable and sustainable city, um, partnering with the sustainable development goals, which is, um, part of the heritage. So our podcast is a, a revival of oral storytelling and it strategically aligns to our mission and goals. It's also, as everyone's discussed, a readily accessible uh, medium. And we created a channel to share stories and collecting and to collect contemporary stories. Podcasting opens our service to new library audiences and has been embedded as a targeted marketing plan initiative. The podcast boom heralds a revival of oral storytelling and opens an innovative way to integrate stories into our everyday lives. And finally, Newcastle has a vibrant podcasting scene and the Newcastle creative industries are identified are an identified target strategic partnership area. So we have our first not-for-profit podcast studio, which is Newcastle Podcast with Melanie, and we've been co collaborating for about three years to establish our channel and create some library partnership podcasts. We also recognised that we needed to take a lifelong learning approach, and we aim to learn from the station's skills and then share the learning opportunities with our team's early adopters. So how? Um, we were lucky enough to build a new library in our new council building and it's called the Digital Library. It's at 12 Stewart Avenue and it has a purpose-built podcast studio inside it. So that was an extremely lucky boon that we were able to pull off. So we focus on a series that explores stories from our region. Our channel is not one stream or theme. We brainstormed a few different series ideas, which we published to the one channel, and we have revisited the ones that worked for us and redefined the ones that didn't. So we call it our real, and it's our reading culture of national and local authors and illustrators. E is for ex exhibitions and the stories around them. A is for archives, books, and the stories in our heritage collection. And L is the local issues affecting our community. To get our channel off the ground, we have a few key things in place. We developed a channel vision and each year an annual schedule. Each series gets a brand and a vague plan developed, very important if it's a collaboration. We do in-house copywriting and we use our in-house recording studio and audio imaging tech. Depending on the podcast, we use a, we, sorry about that phone ringing. We do in-house, um, and our phone is still ringing. 
away. <laughs> we do in-house copywriting and use audio imaging tech. Depending on the podcast, we use a mix of outsourced and in-house post-production. We are still learning in this space. We started with professional voiceovers and now do this in a lot in collaboration or we do it ourselves. We have outsourced or hosted platform and distribution. Um, come back here. So we have a book of, so on the screen there, you can see the podcast studio. I think that's one of our staff members using that there. And then you can see a couple of our podcasters in the podcast station. So, which is only a walk away from the library, which is very convenient. So Newcastle Libraries offers a bookable podcast studio at our digital library. The studio can be booked for sound recording, video conferencing and filming. We have a couple of different background drops that we can put up. One of them is a nice little green screen. It's equipped with a Rodecaster Pro and everything required for podcast production, such as pod mics, ringer headphones, a MacBook Pro. It can also be used for video recording and has a green screen, a smart TV with conference facilities and a webcam. And of course, it's a library, so there's free Wi-Fi and every possible cable for network connections. Library staff can provide assistance in the setup of the equipment. However, we're unable to provide any editing or post-production support. The key difference, be oh, I pressed the wrong button. The key difference between a studio and the station is the post-production support and broadcasting capabilities. We made the call to collaborate with our local podcast station and we leverage their post-production and knowledge and they host our channel. As a city, we have a strong podcast ecosystem. The what? As I mentioned, our channel vision was to look to diversify the library audience and to get Newcastle stories out there. So we do, since 2000, September 2019, we have produced 24 seasons across 13 different series. Um, so you can see some of those on your screen there. Each series has a different coloured tile and we tried to and that sort of made it a bit more uniform, like somebody's already spoken about with branding. We love statistics. It's the ultimate popularity contest. And having my own podcast stream, I really like it when I'm in the top three, I have to say. It gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. So last financial year, we had 6,456 unique downloads from our channel, which statistically brings it on par with the return on investment with our local studies exhibition and programming. The most popular series last year was Newcastle's First Storytellers, followed by our summer reading series and my podcast, which is Treasures from the Rare Book Room series. The learning and insights we get from our podcast channel stats is interesting. Our podcast is getting great traction organically through streaming services, I myself personally use the Spotify and that's how I share it with friends and force them to listen to my podcast to get my stats up. Um, so 30% of our users are from embedded links, which is highly unusual and a great result championed by our library app and website. We sponsored an Omni link on Facebook push, which scored us another 30% of the annual usage. And it was a better spend than our local T to NUR radio when we drill into those stats, which only scored us 2.7% yield. As you can see from the green chart, our download patterns peak and valley with the release of new content over the year. Over the three year life of our channel, we are tracking an average of 50% of access from our Newcastle Libraries website, which is fantastic. Interestingly, our biggest leadership is in Sydney, but it makes sense because of the mass population there. Normally we'd see Brisbane and Melbourne before Newcastle, even in Newcastle production. So having it second means our audience here is strong. Nice visibility across the other states too for the library's brand getting it out there. 
And I just wanted to say when I was looking through Alex's note, there was something else which was quite interesting, um, which is our overseas reach. And I think we reached about 15 different countries um, all the way from uh, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Singapore, Canada, New Zealand, the Isle of Man, Poland and Russia, which I thought was uh, in France. So I thought that was a really quite interesting mix of countries to reach on top of the different states. And there is one lonely stat from Tasmania and I'm gonna claim that as mine because I have a good friend in Tassie. So I make sure he gets to listen to our stuff. In celebration of NAIDOC week, this podcast series explores how Newcastle's Aboriginal communities share and tell stories. This series recognises the First Nations people have occupied and cared for the continent for over 65,000 years. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first explorers, first navigators, first engineers, first farmers, botanists, scientists, diplomats, astronomers and storytellers. Australia has the world's oldest oral storytelling culture and Newcastle has a rich collection of Aboriginal storytellers. Our podcast won Newcastle Podcast of the Year 2020 and was an episode from this series. Donna Meehan is a local author and member of the Stolen Generation. In our award-winning podcast, Donna shares her thoughts on NAIDOC Week, her experience in writing her books, and shares her story with grace and forgiveness. This podcast explores her autobiography, It Is No Secret, which tells the story of her 16-hour train ride to Broadmeadow Railway Station, her life in Newcastle, and her reunion with her birth mother. Donna is a celebrated Aboriginal advocate and active member of the Newcastle community. On the top left of the pictures there, you can see our series host, Karen D. Clark, with Auntie Donna in the recording studio. And you can see Auntie Donna and series producer, Carol Edmonds, accepting the Newcastle Podcast of the Year Award. Um, oh, and he tells me there's a link to that there, so I'll click it and we'll see if that works. Fingers crossed. Um, Kerry, we can share that link and make it available afterwards if you like. Okay, all right. Try and stop it. Okay. Um, go back. My screen back. Okay. Let me get back where I was now. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, if you're in a team like ours, don't let success stand idle. You add value by translating the podcast into face-to-face -face experiences. So these ones here, these are images from my podcast. So these ones I can talk a bit, a little bit better about. Um, so the Treasures from the Rare Book Room series has championed the value add by extending the podcast recording experience by creating mixed media experiences to share our stories, such as the story of Florence Ostral or the captivating story of the Scott sisters of Ash Island. So on the left hand side of the screen, you can see the um, Florence Ostral recording. Florence Ostral was a famous opera singer in the 1930s. And we had a very passionate community group who were wanting to promote her as she did live and die in Newcastle towards the latter half of her life. And on the right hand side of the screen there, you can see some of the beautiful Lepidoptera drawings from the Scott Sisters book that we have in our rare book room collection. And you can see a crowd of people actually looking at the magic box, which is a display technology item that we have in the digital library. 
If you're on a winner, why not declare a festival to be born? We added value by collaborating with Newcastle Podcast Station in 2020 to create exciting live podcast experiences that showcase showcase Newcastle's podcast culture, connect fellow podcasters and create a platform for learning from international keynote speakers. And that festival just went off. It was incredibly popular and everyone had a great time. And lastly, if you push it as far and wide as you can, we have leveraged old and new media platforms to get our stories into as many households as possible. Left, you can see our treasures from the Rare Book Room podcast playing on Amazon in Alex's kitchen at home. And right, the Newcastle Herald celebrating our podcast partnerships and the boom of Newcastle podcasts scene. And there's all the happy recipients of the awards um, at the ceremony that they have. Lots of glitz and glamour, as you can see. So that brings Alex and my presentation to a conclusion. Uh, thank you so much, Kerry. And, and you did an, an amazing job stepping in last minute. So I, I really appreciate you. Uh, taking the time to do that. And I uh, can definitely vouch for the quality of Newcastle's podcast, a, a very varied slate of topics and themes. Uh, so I'd recommend that. Uh, and at this point, we have our last speaker. Uh, we're running over time, but we will keep going after 12. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how far we get. But this is the point of this morning where I get to show off about some of the awesome work that happens here at the State Library. And part, some of that work is done by our senior curator, Elise Edmonds. Anyone in Sydney or can get to Sydney, I'd highly recommend coming along to see Elise's new exhibition, Kill or Cure. But Elise has also been heavily involved in our podcast. So uh, thank you so much for joining me, Elise, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Michael. Um, sorry, I'm in a bit of a dodgy small little room, <laughs> but I will um, share my screen so you don't see uh, my dodgy little room. Okay. So hopefully you are seeing my um, slideshow now. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you briefly about two um, podcasts that we worked on here at the library. Um, I'm currently at the State Library. I'm on Gadigal land, um, which uh, was now and always will be Aboriginal lands. And I'd um, like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging. Um, so there was just two of us who worked on these two podcast series. Um, over the last couple of years, myself and my uh, colleague, Sabrina Organo, who is the multimedia creative producer in our exhibitions uh, team here at the library. Um, Sabrina has a background in TV and filmmaking, so she brought all the skills to these projects that I do not have um, in terms of scripting, producing, recording and editing the content. Um, so as a curator, I was able to locate a lot of amazing stuff in the library's collection. Um, so I did that sort of initial research and selection, and I also narrated the two podcast series. Um, our goals were really to build a new audience for the library and to be able to share our collections in an innovative and creative way. And um, my, these podcasts are described, I guess, as non-fiction narrative style, as per Lauren and Cara's slide about the different styles. So, yeah, it's, it's non-fiction narrative. Um, and really the first one, um, The Burial Files, um, was linked in with an exhibition that both Sabrina and I worked on. We produced and... Um, curated the exhibition Dead Central, which was on in 2019 through to 2020, um, when the world stopped. Um, Dead Central, um, the exhibition told the story of the old Devonshire Street uh, Cemetery, uh, which is now where Central Station stands. Um, it was a fantastic topic um, that I think lots of people were just fascinated by, um, particularly Sydney people, people who all over New South Wales, who obviously travel through Central Station, not knowing what you know, lay beneath them. Um, so the exhibition was an immersive audio experience. Um, it was told in seven chapters through headphones that you listened as you walked around the exhibition space. Um, it was 
creative storytelling um, based, of course, on history, um, using soundscapes, actors' voices, um, and the whole sort of history of that location in Sydney unfolded in your ears as you walked through. Um, and as the exhibition was audio, um, and there were so many different stories that we couldn't tell in the space, we decided that podcasting was the way to go um, as an opportunity to delve much deeper into the topic that we knew that people would find fascinating. And both Sabrina and I are total podcast tragics anyway. Um, so this is the um, old cemetery um, where Central Station now is. Um, we, I guess the themes that we sort of pulled out, we did nine episodes of the burial files. Um, we looked at the location. So the first episode is me being an idiot at Central Station, walking around asking people what they, you know, if they knew what was here before Central Station. Um, uh, so we, we talked about the location um, in, in time, in history. We looked at the, some of the individuals who were buried in the cemetery, and that was a massive draw card, as you would imagine, particularly for genealogists and, and family historians, um, delving into what it was like to live in 19th century Sydney. And then the other sort of big theme was Sydney infrastructure, which, um, you know, uh, is always the same, sort of um, Sydney having to build um, more and more infrastructure for a growing city. So there were a lot of themes that we um, learned about in the early 20th century that we can apply now to the 21st. And at the time that we were doing the recording, um, the Sydney Metro were beginning the construction at Central Station. So we were able to cover that as well and had a few surprises um, as Sydney Metro began digging um, down into the, um, through at platform 13. So that's just another shot of this amazing old cemetery. The library, of course, has all of these fantastic photographs that were taken prior to the cemetery being resumed. Um, and the exhibition, um, uh, Dead Central, really focused on the work of these two um, people, the Fosters, Mr. and Mrs. Foster, who lived nearby in Surrey Hills. Um, they were amateur historians and they decided before the cemetery was actually resumed that they were going to record the cemetery. Um, Mrs Foster um, took photographs of the cemetery, you can see her there. Um, so she took all the awesome photographs of the various headstones and then Mr Foster actually transcribed, recorded um, what was written on the headstones. They didn't do the whole cemetery but they gave it a red hot go. Um, so the exhibition centred around their work, but we wanted to go further, as, as I said, um, in the podcast series. So we recorded um, remotely, as I said, we recorded at Central Station, we recorded down in the library stacks, we recorded outside at the Botany Cemetery, which was super challenging because it's right near Sydney Airport. Um, and we were able to interview a range of experts, such as historians, archaeologists, forensic anthropologists, um, train buffs and landscape historians. Um, and we also used the work, um, we, we um, acquired the work of voice actors who read out many of the headstone inscriptions and also the newspaper um, articles that we found that helped tell the story. And look, um, it, just to give you a little taste of some of the things that were recorded on the headstones, um, the, the words, I just got really fascinated by what was written on these headstones. Very different, I think, to how we memorialise people who've passed these days. Um, a lot of them would actually describe how the person died and you get a really um, massive um, insight into you know, um, life in 19th century Sydney was brutal life, um, often very cut short, as you can see by William Oliver, who was killed by a bullet cart at the age of 34. Um, and uh, also, um, I won't read these out, but really um, tragic stories of, um, you know, a young woman who died at the age of 22 after the sudden and awful, hearing about the sudden and awful death of her husband um, and, you know, their son, Alexander, and age two days um, old was also buried with her. Um, this amazing um, uh, transcription about a doctor, Joseph Mayrick, who was a surgeon of Tahiti, um, who uh, was apparently, um, unfortunately, assassinated by a lunatic in this city. Um, so that um, headstone really wanted, um, I really wanted to delve deeper into that story to find out you know, who was this doctor, what happened, who was this lunatic, and there's, we dedicated one of the um, episodes in the podcast to telling that story, and of course it opened up for the, us this fantastic opportunity to tell the story of mental health um, in the colony and understandings of mental health, and um, yes, what happened to this person um, who was named as, as a lunatic. Um, 
the headstones are incredibly evocative language. So again, that is why we decided that the exhibition would be an audio one, and as well that it works so well with podcasts to have um, actors to be able to read out these in a really beautiful way. Um, the opportunity was also there to really um, delve into people that we just didn't know much about. So um, on the one head, this big headstone is, is Mary Reby, that famous convict woman made good, very successful businesswoman. A lot of people, a lot is known about Mary Reby. Um, and the headstone next to hers is another Mary, Mary Curran, who lived a very sad life. Um, she was also a convict woman, but she her life was not made good. Um, she suffered domestic violence um, and she was found drowned um, uh, in the harbour. And so it's, again, it's this opportunity to delve deeper, to have that luxury of time, to tell a story at our own pace um, and to interview as many experts as we wanted to. So it was um, a wonderful experience to do that because often, of course, when you're ex um, curating an exhibition, you're limited to word length and everything has to be pithy. Um, and so I guess podcasting allows that possibility to be able to go deeper, particularly for listeners who are really interested in the topic. So that was the burial files. I'm just speeding through this quite quickly. Um, once the, um, the COVID lockdown happened, um, we kind of obviously all the library, we all went into lockdown um, in early 2020. And so my colleague Sabrina decided that we should do a second podcast series um, building on from our ex experience we gained from the burial files. Um, so we started looking at telling the story about the last great pandemic that hit the world and hit Australia, which was um, the, what, what used to be called the Spanish flu um, pandemic, which was, it's called pneumonic influenza. Um, and so we decided to tell this story in um, five part, in a five part series, really looking back at how um, Australian society coped with um, this, the impact of, um, of uh, influenza. And it was really a whole thing of um, now and then. So of course, if you recall in 2020, the whole idea of masks and isolation and quarantine was all quite new to us. But once you start you know, learning about the Spanish flu, it all happened like that before. It was all the same um, information and all the same behavior. Um, so in the library's collection, of course, we've got some fantastic photographs of people in Sydney in 1919, all wearing masks um, for a start. Um, and also um, the library has a fantastic um, nationally significant collection of World War I diaries, handwritten diaries. And um, the uh, flu pandemic hit Europe, hit the Northern Hemisphere in 1918, while the, the war was still happening. And so some of the um, earliest accounts um, of Australians um, uh, experiencing the influenza um, pandemic were soldiers and nurses, and they write about um, how they were feeling. Um, and there's some great quotes from this soldier, Archie Barwick, um, talking about how he was put to bed feeling about the worst I've ever felt in my life. I didn't care what happened. And um, the, the um, Australians over in Europe during the war called it the dog's disease. I've got this dog's disease in very bad form. Um, and again, once you start hearing um, the language in the diaries, Archie Barwick's diary is particularly um, evocative. He writes in such a wonderful, natural way. It just lends itself to having a young bloke um, actor read it out in a, just a really personable, um, uh, lovely way that just really takes you back into time and you can sort of imagine what Archie was going through. Um, and so it was really fun. Of course, we recorded all of it remotely in our own homes. So Sabrina and I linked in to, um, I think it was um, Teams or something else, I can't remember. And we had to obviously remotely link in with the sound recording person um, and also the actor themselves. So it was a challenge, but um, we got there. Um, uh, again, we had um, fantastic references in the collection of um, a nurse and Danelle who wrote about, um, you know, actually being in the hospitals looking after um, men who were all suffering from um, the Spanish influenza and, and then of course all of the medical staff start getting the sickness as well and so she talks really beautifully about losing um, various um, nurses, nurse colleagues as well and how exhausting the whole process was. Um, again, we um, get very excited about finding um, obscure ephemera in the library's collection. We record down in stack. Um, we found this awesome big card. It's like an A3 size card, SOS. 
and that was if you were struggling at home um, with the um, illness in Sydney, you put that in your window and healthcare workers would drive past in their motorcycles or would walk past and would um, uh, help you or take you to a, a local hospital to be cared for. Um, people didn't even have phones then, um, let alone apps or anything like that. So it was again this whole now and then um, combination of um, content. And um, we also had some beautiful um, uh, in memory sort of um, uh, collections relating to the death of a, a young teenage boy, Keith, um, who lived in Balmain. Um, so we have a whole collection of letters and sympathy cards that were sent to the family after his death. Um, of the Spanish flu. So we really kind of talk about um, how many people in Australia and New South Wales um, died and who were affected by, by this illness um, as we try to sort of navigate through 2020 and trying to understand how COVID was affecting our communities. Um, Unlike the burial files, we didn't really record remotely too much, again, because of lockdown issues, but we managed to get to the North Head quarantine station where our first episode takes place, um, because that's where um, the, quarantined, the quarantine people were um, sent when they were testing positive for the Spanish flu. Um, and there is a fantastic cemetery up the top of North Head. Um, in National Park where we recorded and um, it's just a really beautiful place if you're in the area I highly recommend you access that and um, take a look at some of the um, headstones that were um, there um, erected to people who died of the Spanish flu as well as the plague when it broke out at the early century. Um, just finally we we've had some really good feedback um, uh, obviously people can write um, comments um, on the podcast platforms of, of what they thought they can review our content um, so it just it was just super encouraging because you know you felt like you were sort of working in a void not knowing if it was going to work um, so it's really rewarding that we we got such great um, comments um, and you know our the ultimate was that particularly the burial files was described as binge worthy um, and people really wanted to binge all nine episodes in one go almost, which was fantastic. And, you know, it's really rewarding to, for, pe for people to get really excited about history podcasts um, because sometimes they, yeah, can be a bit um, challenging to keep people's attention. Um, so that is really all I was going to uh, share with you. So I will uh, stop my presentation now. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Elise, and congratulations on your work in, in bringing these stories to life. Um, that brings us to the end of today's session. I wanna thank all of our presenters. I've, I've had such a great morning listening to all of your presentations that would you know, really cover the gamut of what you can do in podcasts. So I hope that has provided some inspiration to everyone who's attended today. And I hope this time next year, we have even more public library podcasts to discuss. But thank you all for attending. Uh, as I said, please complete the evaluation form that you'll be sent. Uh, please sign up for our PLS e-news and the In the Libraries e-newsletter. And I will be in touch soon with uh, some more details, uh, with answers to questions, with slides from our presenters. And if you have any other questions, please uh, feel free to get in touch with me and um, I will be speaking to you all shortly. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone.